Hi, ActiveHistory.ca is happy to present a recording of a scholarly tribute to Bettina Bradbury, feminist historian of the family, a roundtable discussion. The roundtable was chaired by Magda Farney and featured panelists Dominique Marshall, Marie Ann Putinen, Liz Millward, and Jared Henderson. The session was held Monday, May 26, 2014, as part of the Canadian Historical Association annual meeting. You can find recordings of other talks at activehistory.ca. Welcome to the scholarly tribute to Bettina Bradbury. This is a roundtable sponsored, as you know, by the Canadian Committee on Women's History. And I'm really delighted to chair this session in my capacity as the outgoing chair of the CCWH and also in my capacity as one of Bettina's former PhD students. <laughs> Bettina Bradbury's scholarly work needs no introduction. Uh, her first monograph, Working Families, Age, Gender, and Daily Survival in Industrializing Montreal, published in 1993, transformed our understanding of the Industrial Revolution in Quebec and Canada, and was awarded numerous prizes, including the CHA's John A. MacDonald Prize and the Harold Adams Innes Prize. Her more recent book, Wife to Widow, Lives, Laws, and Politics in 19th Century Montreal, published by UBC Press in 2011, is similarly impressive, and as Michel Duchamp recently noted in the pages of Histoire Sociale, Social History, Wife to Widow is, and I quote, déjà un, un ouvrage incontournable de l'histoire du Bas-Canada. It was awarded both the Institut d'Histoire de l'Amérique Française as Prix Lionel Groux uh, and the Canadian Historical Association's Cléo Québec Prize. <coughs> Bettina is, in addition, the author of numerous articles and book chapters on topics related to families, women, and gender in 19th century Quebec and Canada, and, as we just saw in the last session, across the British Empire more broadly. In 2011, Bettina was the recipient of York University's Faculty of Graduate Studies Teaching Award. She has supervised a large number of MA and PhD theses, first at the Université de Montréal and then at York, in both history and women's studies. So during the course of this roundtable, we're going to hear from four of her former PhD students, uh, two from the, the UDM and two from York, all of whom are now prize-winning scholars in their own right. Uh, Dominique Marshall, uh, PhD, Université de Montréal, 1990, Marianne Putinen, PhD, Université de Montréal, 1996. Liz Millward, PhD, uh, Women's Studies, York, 2003. And Jared Henderson, PhD, History, York, 2010. Will each speak for 15 minutes about their own historical research and will reflect upon the ways in which Bettina has inspired or influenced or in some way helped to shape uh, this research. So I will introduce each of... Actually, no, I'll introduce the speakers one at a time. Uh, et je vais commencer par Dominique Marshall. Dominique est professeure titulaire au département d'histoire de l'Université Carleton à Ottawa. Elle est également euh, notre présidente, la présidente de la Société historique du Canada. Son livre « Aux origines sociales de l'État-providence euh, » tiré de sa thèse de doctorat est publié par les presses de l'Université de Montréal en 1998 a mérité le prix Jean-Charles Falardeau. En 2006, ce livre a été traduit en anglais sous le titre « The Social Origins of the Welfare State » Quebec Families, Compulsory Education and Family Allowances, 1940-1955. Et ses recherches actuelles portent sur les droits des enfants au Canada et à l'échelle internationale. Alors, Dominique. Merci, merci, Maître, d'avoir organisé euh, la table ronde. Puis, euh, euh, Dominique a distribué des copies de mon papier euh, pour ceux d'entre vous qui ne comprennent pas le français. Puis, quand je parle trop vite, ils ont de la misère à me suivre. À l'occasion de la table ronde que Magda a eu la bonne idée d'assembler pour parler des travaux de Bettina, j'ai pensé que je pourrais demander à celle qui a dirigé mes travaux de doctorat il y a 25 ans à l'Université de Montréal comment elle s'y est prise pour m'initier au rouage du métier et comment, par la suite, elle a fait de même pour des douzaines d'autres étudiants à la maîtrise et au doctorat. La plupart de ces conseils font maintenant partie de mon bagage d'enseignante pour le bénéfice d'une seconde génération d'étudiants et je continue de lire les écrits de plusieurs de ces étudiants dont la réputation contribue à faire de York un des hauts lieux d'entraînement à l'histoire. Euh, J'ai donc pensé que ma curiosité à l'endroit de son travail considérable de supervision et le partage de souvenirs communs pourrait faire l'objet d'une belle conversation que nous avons tenue au téléphone entre Toronto et Ottawa le mois dernier. Ce sont ces propos que je tenterai de partager avec vous cet après-midi pour discuter de pratiques sur lesquelles ni Bettina ni moi avons beaucoup lu, puisqu'il y a peu d'écrits à ce sujet, de manuels d'instruction, d'occasions de formation professionnelle ou même de vocabulaire. 
Pour commencer, je lui ai expliqué d'où venaient mes questions. J'espérais avoir l'occasion d'explorer l'idée encore floue qu'au cycle supérieur, la transmission du métier d'historien, d'intellectuel ou d'universitaire se fait en partie en vertu d'un apprentissage sur le temps. À mesure que j'ai à mon tour supervisé des étudiants au cycle supérieur, il m'a semblé important de leur montrer comment je ferais à leur place, de leur donner à voir le meilleur de mes pratiques. Autrement dit, il m'est apparu qu'ils apprendraient surtout en me regardant faire, plutôt par exemple que de leur donner des commentaires à difficulté croissante quand je lis leurs textes. J'essaye de leur montrer tout en même temps, en discutant ce que j'aurais fait dans les mêmes circonstances ou encore en confrontant leurs interprétations aux miennes franchement. Avec le pari qu'ils auront beaucoup à gagner en retenant, d'une rencontre à l'autre et de façon aléatoire, ce qu'ils peuvent ou veulent de mes méthodes, de mes habitudes de pensée. Par quel processus tout cela peut se produire? Osmose, imitation, répétition, observation, accumulation, difficile à dire. En sens inverse, il me semble qu'à ce jour, mon propre parcours a été sommé de moments forts où figure la remarque d'un professeur ou plus tard les propos d'un collègue. Telle institutrice de mathématiques à, qui avoua avoir eu tort dans une de ses réponses de la classe du jour précédent. Tel professeur d'histoire urbaine rejetant mon ébauche de plan pour un long travail de recherche en disant qu'il ne me posait aucun défi intéressant. Bettina elle-même, après la première lecture d'une portion considérable de ma thèse, déclarant avec tout le tact nécessaire qu'après avoir passé des mois à lire des archives gouvernementales, j'en étais venue à écrire dans le style des bureaucrates de mes archives. <rires> « First and foremost », ajouta-t-elle en, en me renvoyant à la planche, « you'll have to tell a story ». C'est au sujet de ces influences, de ces temps forts, que les candidats pour une bourse, un prix, un emploi, sont souvent les plus éloquents. De même, la série des conférences de l'American Council of Learned Societies, intitulée « A Life of Learning », qui donne l'occasion à un chercheur « to reflect on a lifetime of work as a scholar and an institution builder on the motives, the chance, determinations, the satisfactions and dissatisfactions of the life of learning to explore through one's own life the larger institu institutional life of scholarship » se lit comme une succession d'expériences de proximité où il est difficile de repérer avec précision les vecteurs et les rythmes des formations. Ces préoccupations rencontrent celles de mes propres travaux sur l'histoire de l'aide humanitaire que Magda m'a demandé de partager aujourd'hui. Il est fascinant, par exemple, de voir comment, depuis les années d'après-guerre, les pionniers d'Oxfam que j'ai interrogés, au Royaume-Uni comme au Canada, ont apporté à la tâche des traditions aussi diverses que celles du droit des affaires, de l'armée de l'air ou encore du syndicalisme des pêcheurs, pour mettre au point des pratiques originales et innovatrices qui s'enseignent maintenant dans les manuels et les programmes de développement international ou de philanthropie. Mais les mêmes humanitaires aujourd'hui se plaignent du manque de sens pratique et de cohérence de leurs collègues formés dans des universités. Une partie de la réponse à ces questions est apparue au hasard d'une conversation avec le pédagogue de Laval, Fernand Gervais, où nous comparions les traditions des campus anglophones et francophones dans lesquels nous avions travaillé. Pour parler de la difficulté de discerner des traditions en matière d'études avancées, j'ai abordé la question de la difficulté même d'évaluer ce type d'enseignement. Les étudiants sont peu nombreux, leur rétroaction difficile à obtenir, même pour les superviseurs qui, comme Bettina, dirigent beaucoup plus de thèses que la moyenne d'entre nous. La qualité du produit final compte pour beaucoup dans les bilans, les bilans que nous dressons de la qualité de nos supervisions. Mais le lien entre la qualité d'une thèse et la nature des interventions d'un superviseur est difficile à établir. Comme Bettina le dit elle-même, les aptitudes de départ importent beaucoup. « J'ai eu la chance d'avoir de très bons étudiants », dit-elle, ce qui n'est pas donné à tous. Lorsque j'ai parlé à Fernand Gervais de la façon que j'ai de tout enseigner à la fois, de laisser l'observation faire son travail du côté de l'étudiant, il a pensé aux travaux de l'anthropologue social des apprentissages auprès de laquelle il a lui-même travaillé dans les années 80, l'américaine Jane Lave. En étudiant les apprentis tailleurs du Liberia, Lave avait montré comment « It is difficult, when looking closely at everyday activity, to avoid the conclusion that learning is ubiquitous in ongoing activity, though often unrecognized as such. » Et Fernand a remarqué que, curieusement, dans le monde par excellence de l'instruction formelle qu'est l'université, la direction de thèse pourrait bien offrir un espace privilégié d'apprentissage informel. Si tel est le cas, le vocabulaire de ce que Lève en est venu à appeler la théorie du « situated learning » ou encore « cognition située » en français 
et la méthode associée de la « legitimate peripheral participation » pourrait peut-être aider, aider à mieux comprendre la nature de la supervision. C'est ce que je tenterai de faire dans les minutes qui viennent en rapportant les points saillants de mon échange du mois dernier avec Bettina. Elle a dit dans la conférence qu'elle a prononcée il y a deux ans à York sur son parcours d'historienne comment elle s'est retrouvée peu après son embauche à l'Université de Montréal avec 18 étudiants à superviser et avec la direction des études à avancer, à avancer à assumer. Par la force des choses, dit-elle, j'ai dû demander aux étudiants d'apprendre entre eux en créant des occasions d'échange de manuscrits, en m'assurant que tous aient compris les règles de la critique constructive, une méthode qui, pour avoir porté fruit, a survécu à la folie de cette charge initiale de travail. C'était aussi, s'est-elle rendu compte, une façon d'initier les étudiants à la supervision. Il s'agissait déjà pour elle d'un apprentissage sur, la ta, de, de, sur le tas de la « politics of learning in everyday life » qui fait l'objet de l'une des communications de, Jane, de Lave. Bettina avait tout fait elle-même l'expérience de cette introduction horizon, horizontale aux méthodes d'enseignement en aidant John, son mari, à finir sa thèse de géographie et en partageant les discussions de ses collègues en économie politique. Elle n'eut plus tard que peu de rapport avec ses propres superviseurs qu'elle remercie encore de l'avoir laissé tranquille. Pour ma part, cette émission au travail même de superviseur représente une formation dont je n'avais pas du tout reconnu l'existence à l'époque. Jean Lave dirait qu'elle a été « non-recognized as such ». À un quart de siècle de distance, Bettina se rappelle de certaines de nos rencontres différemment de moi, un problème bien connu des collègues férus d'histoire orale. Ce jour particulier, où il paraît que je me suis présentée avec un manuscrit presque complet, après des semaines de travail autonome, rempli de résultats de recherche intéressants, mais qui était organisé d'une façon insolite. C'était tout à refaire, à refaire se rappelle-t-elle, il fallait tout changer de place, une chose difficile à dire à une étudiante et une tâche difficile. Je suis apparemment reparti sans découragement pour revenir quelques semaines plus tard avec un texte qui avait de l'allure. Un exemple sûrement des miracles de la critique constructive bien comprise à laquelle Bettina attachait déjà tant d'importance. Un exemple aussi de la modestie de ses apports. Le processus par lequel je suis parvenu à un découpage des problèmes au cours de ces mois de 1988 et qui me sert toujours bien souvent pour approcher d'autres questions n'est pas clair du tout dans mes souvenirs. Je crois que c'est au cours de cette période, de ce que l'AV appellerait « ubiquitous ongoing activity », que j'ai acquis le minimum de confiance requis pour organiser mes propres résultats de recherche. Je me rappelle mieux d'autres aspects de mes années de doctorat. La rapidité de ces, des réponses de Bettina à mes demandes de commentaires, l'invitation à participer à la même conférence internationale, celle de publier ma communication dans sa collection d'articles sur l'histoire de la famille, ces bons mots pour faciliter mon arrivée au département d'administration sociale de la London School of Economics où travaillait l'historienne féministe des politiques sociales Jane Lewis, ou encore un peu plus tard son encouragement à faire partie du comité de rédaction de la revue de la Société historique Canada, du Canada qu'elle venait de quitter pour travailler, disait-elle, avec un groupe de personnes qui sont toujours intéressants. J'ai depuis tenté d'imiter de mon mieux la générosité et la candeur de ses commentaires et plus largement, de reprendre l'idée que mes étudiants apprendraient en me regardant faire euh, si je prenais le temps de les associer à certaines de mes activités professionnelles. Ce que l'anthropologue Jane Lave m'aide à comprendre, c'est qu'il ne s'agissait pas simplement d'une initiation à des techniques par émulation, mais d'une invitation à entrer dans ce que Lave appelle les communautés de pratique, qui seules pouvaient donner leur sens aux choses à apprendre c'est-à-dire un anthropological emphasis on learning as quintessentially contextualized, socially organized and active. En effet, en comparant les façons dont les apprentis tailleurs libériens peuvent, peuvent utiliser les mathématiques apprises en découpant leur tissu pour répondre à des problèmes nouveaux, et celles dont les Américains de son voisinage utilisent les mathématiques dans leur visite à l'épicerie sans se servir plus avant de ces apprentissages, Lève a montré que les circonstances où les connaissances sont appropriées comptent tellement que, à la limite, et c'est ce que Fernand Gervais explique, le contexte des apprentissages n'est pas le contenant de la formation, comme le bon sens le suggère, mais plutôt le contenu de tout apprentissage en situation. C'est cela qu'elle entend, je crois, par « situated learning ». On peut utiliser la même idée pour expliquer davantage l'importance, assez bien reconnue parmi nos collègues, de faire en sorte que les étudiants des cycles avancés 
est un accès significatif à d'autres intellectuels que leurs propres superviseurs. On peut enfin envisager l'interdisciplinarité de cette façon. Là-dessus, je dois beaucoup à Bettina, qui avait lu en profondeur et avec cohérence plusieurs des canons de la nouvelle économie politique canadienne que les géographes, familles et collègues de son mari lui avaient fait connaître. Occupé à analyser les premiers temps de l'État-providence, j'ai alors emprunté plusieurs éléments de leur vocabulaire, sans trop savoir, encore une fois, que j'entrais dans une communauté de sens. Quand le hasard a voulu que j'atterrisse à Carlton, où les Panitch et Whitaker avaient fait leurs armes et laissé un héritage institutionnel bien vivant, j'ai pu rapidement bénéficier de ma connaissance, habitué que j'étais à leurs approches. Pour résumer, Jean Lay va travailler à élargir les idées classiques sur l'apprentissage pour montrer comment il s'agit de beaucoup plus que d'imitation et de répétition. Elle a suggéré que les distinctions entre apprentissage formel et informel sont beaucoup moins grandes qu'on ne le croit. Fernand Gervais, qui connaît bien ses travaux, le savait peut-être quand il m'a parlé ce soir-là du paradoxe des apprentissages informels dans les universités. Et, fait intéressant, Jean Lave est devenue sur le tard historienne pour étudier l'acquisition de l'identité chez les Britanniques du siècle dernier. Pour conclure, l'anthropologue attachait à la, une grande valeur à l'autonomie acquise par les jeunes tailleurs en bout de ligne de leur apprentissage et à ce que cette autonomie apportait de sens à leur vie dans leur communauté respective. Cette prime à la faculté d'agir avec indépendance se retrouve souvent dans les propos de Bettina. Ces mots de l'autre jour ont tourné autour de l'importance de cultiver l'autonomie des étudiants qu'elle supervise. La métaphore qui lui vient à l'esprit est celle d'une balle qu'on lance à ses apprentis. Elle a parlé de la fierté qu'un superviseur éprouve à observer ceux qui apprennent à la lancer plus loin. « Some of them, dit-elle, take the ball, bounce it, and go further with it. » Thank you. Uh, our second speaker is Marianne Houghtonen. Marianne teaches in the History Department at Concordia University and in McGill's Quebec Studies Program, and she is a longtime member, a founding member, really, of the Montreal History Group. She is the author, with Roderick McLeod, of the prize-winning A Meeting of the People, School Boards and Protestant Cumu Communities in Quebec, 1810 to 1998, and her book manuscript entitled Beyond Brutal Passions, Prostitution in Early 19th Century Montreal is currently under review at McGill Queen's University Press. Marianne. Well, I, I also want to begin by thanking Magda Farney and the CCWH for organizing this afternoon's session. I, and I want to say it is a privilege to participate in a round table to honor Bettina. So as we all know, she has had a significant impact on Quebec and Canadian history, making connections between work uh, women, the household, and the economy were none at first glance had seemed apparent. She is well known for her meticulous studies of the household economy during industrialization, arguing that the significance of economic change was writ large on family roles and, and subsistence strategies. Consulting a wide-ranging collection of sources, Bettina treats the household with compassion, and details its importance in determining working class experience. She shows how people shape their lives to the best of their abilities by using different resources around them and, and instituting diverse tactics, such as keeping pigs and cows, taking in borders, and so much more. In locating crucial links between the family and the household economy, workplace struggles, and industrialization, she demonstrates the vast array of strategies that the working class implemented in confronting and resisting capitalist society. Bettina establishes that women's non-waged and informal work was vital to the household economy, turning wages into subsistence. Her revenue generating and revenue um, saving activities were crucial to the integrity and standard of living and overall comfort of those who inhabited the household. In so doing, Bettina makes women's work visible, demonstrates its diversity and complexity, and reveals that the realities of daily life were at odds with prevailing discourses about what laboring women were supposed to be doing. Historians she counsels must expand their gaze beyond the work uh, place or factory floor to women's unpaid labor, workers' households, and their families. 
<laughs> Wife to Widow has all of the hallmarks of her first book, Working Families. It not only integrates many of the more recent developments in the concept of a household economy by historians such as Alan Ross, Catherine Hall, and Leonore uh, Davidoff, interest in culture, identity, representation, and religion, but also Wife to Widow depicts a more co uh, complete sense of widowhood illuminated by her employment of biography to illustrate intricate details of their lives. Consulting a broad range of sources, Bettina explores widowhood, not only from discursive and legal frames, but also from the perspective of women's lived experiences. Again, we see her extensive and effective use of sources as she traces the lives of wives in their journeys from marriage to widowhood. In the time I have left, I will explore how Bettina's concept of the household economy has informed some of my work on sex commerce, specifically residential prostitution, and how my new project on women in taverns will put this concept to work. Perhaps the article so frequently associated with Bettina, Pigs, Cows, and Borders, ought to be expanded at least for the purposes of this roundtable today, to in include pigs, cows, borders, drink, and sex. <laughs> Historians have usually constructed prostitution within a context of the woman alone and isolated from her family, friends, and community. Consequently, histories of the family and of sex commerce have given the impression that they are irreconcilable. Bettina brings the two literatures together in a book working families. She argues that widows incorporated a wide range of remunerative, remunerative uh, activities into their households that included prostitution to carry out their family responsibilities while earning much needed cash. And in my book, uh, manu uh, Manuscript Beyond Brutal Passions, I apply Bettina's concept of the household economy to determine how and under what circumstances women integrated residential prostitution into their households. Married, wi um, widowed, and single women with some capital established brothels to meet their personal or their fa family subsistence needs. Thus, home and brothel were not distinct or separate operations. Married couples, as well as men who made partnerships with women, not their wives, with family members, or with future spouses, also operated brothels. Parents and children worked together in what I call a sort of family establishment. Um, and although the majority of unmarried women labored as prostitutes for widowed and married brothel keepers, they also operated home brothels together. A renewed interest in the history of single or independent women have resulted in a growing and rich literature which I have incorporated to show that unmarried women too created household economies to meet their subsistence needs. Scholars such as Bridget Hall, Judith Bennett, and Amy Freud, uh, and I must mention o Owen Houghton, who has already shown the benefits of spinster cl uh, clustering in 18th century France. They argue that single women pooled resources, achieved their own subsistence, and shared the costs associated with rent and heat, as well as divided household tasks, chief among them going to market, preparing food, and conveying wood and water. Keepers of brothels then had to ensure that the necessary duties related to running a household were carried out in addition to managing complicated human relations while overseeing the business of residential prostitution. And as Bettina makes clear, the interaction between the local economy and the household must be taken into consideration when examining the subsistence tactics that women initiated in their homes. Changing economic forces and circumstances required family members to reformulate such subsistence strategies. Household economies were more precarious if primary wage earners were underemployed, worked in low-paid jobs, were unable to work owing to illness or unemployment, or were no longer present. Undoubtedly, diverse circumstances drew women into sex commerce. 
Their decision to establish brothels was based upon a complex range of options which differed according to each woman's individual character and circumstances, her social class, race, ethnicity, and marital status. Notwithstanding a few women who established houses of prostitution in abandoned buildings, single rooms, and cellars, abject poverty narrowed their choices. For those with household capital, keeping brothels provided the means for ready cash. Wives with ill or unemployed husbands, deserted uh, women, those fleeing abusive or drunken spouses, single women and widows chose residential prostitution. Participating in economies of expediency where the moral imperatives were less important. Single women also chose (coughs) prostitution to achieve economic, social, and sexual independence. Residential prostitution provided an income beyond that typically associated with female wage earning in pre-industrial Montreal. Brothels accommodated an an assortment, uh, assorted people involved in convoluted and ambiguous relationships where respective inmates wielded varying degrees of power rooted in gender relations. Although difficult to detect explicitly, given the nature of court documents, the brothel was also characterized by loving relations between husbands and wives, lovers, parents, and their children, in addition to friendships among brothel prostitutes. Participation in residential prostitution did not rule out Uh, matrimony, and some couples who lived together in brothels without the the benefit of a marriage certificate eventually married. Others not only instituted self-divorce, but also entered into um, a whole variety of non-legal marriages. Nonetheless, some of the women truly had to maneuver around a volatile field of human landmines which included the brutality of conjugal violence, clients' threats and assaults, parental uh, coercion of daughters, as well as brothel keepers' intimidation of prostitutes. Thus, women's work in the home also included, as Bettina has argued, uh, tension management associated with difficult life situations. The home brothel was no different, and men were more likely to initiate acts of aggression not only as clients, but also as husbands and lovers. Neighbors intervened in cases of conjugal violence involving brothel keepers, disciplined those who did not respect community norms, and interacted with them as neighbors. While the boundaries between the respectable and non-respectable could be blurred, popular class women were ambivalent about female neighbors who marketed sex. On the one hand, Women shouldered domestic responsibilities, including efforts to stretch inadequate wages, no matter their reputations. And on the other hand, money paid to prostitutes diminished household revenues, um, associations with prostitutes could tarnish reputations, and men who visited prostitutes risked infecting wives with venereal diseases, given that all of them had unprotected sex. Anna Clark has argued, quote, when respectable women snubbed their fallen sisters, they were expressing their solidarity with injured wives rather than with unfortunate women, end of quote. Let me turn now to a new study which focuses on Montreal, or pardon me, on women who held tavern licenses and on those who were married to keepers in Montreal in the years 1840 to 1880. My goal is to write a monograph on the history of women's diverse roles in Montreal, um, in Montreal's public houses, and in so doing, make women's work in taverns and inns more visible. And I might add the only um, advice that Bettina has given me on this is, I hope you do it really fast, <laughs> and in comparison to how long it's taken me to, <laughs> to write my uh, manuscript on prostitution. So it's a promise, but I always said to my graduates, do as I say, not what I do. <laughs> um, it is the concept of the household economy that allows me to shift the lens from men to women 
consider what effect the economy has had on the strategies um, women implemented, and identify the particular choices women who were married to keepers made uh, when they were widowed. These family businesses, as Jane Arrington shows, depended upon women's work to succeed, which gave them some degree of power, which I know Bettina would agree. Um, in, a particular, in a preliminary examination of the years 1840 to 1860, <clears throat> using applications for tavern licenses, census returns, municipal tax rolls, city directories, newspaper accounts, and criminal court records, I identified at least 90 women who held tavern licenses and operated taverns and inns. As keepers of small, medium, and large public houses, such business activities afforded these women opportunities to contribute to the household economy or to achieve some economic independence. Nonetheless, to keep these licenses, they had to carefully negotiate the boundaries of respectability by following the rules associated with licensing, by submitting to an annual inspection of their establishments and by regulating the culture and the clientele who patronized their businesses. So tavern licenses permitted these women to retail alcoholic beverages such as spirits, wine and beer in small measure and to furnish lodgings and meals for a fee. While the sale of such beverages was profitable and allowed female keepers to juggle their household responsibilities while serving customers. Operating public houses meant that women worked long hours. They welcomed travelers at all hours of the day and night, stabled horses, prepared meals, served drinks, laundered linens, and dealt with inebriated customers who may or, not, or may not have been able to pay their tab. Female tavern and innkeepers, like their male counterparts, required access to capital and credit to supply the business with everything from furnishings and cooking gear to food and alcohol in bulk. They purchased goods and supplies locally and usually on credit. As keepers of public houses, women needed a good head for business because they had to extend credit to customers. Julia Roberts' study of taverns in Upper Canada shows that keeping taverns was a female trade, at least in small establishments. In Montreal, as elsewhere, women who were married to keepers also provided the main source of labor in public houses. Such places were also domestic spaces, that is to say, homes to the keepers' families. Married women managed these businesses when, especially when husbands pursued other types of work, provided the domestic labor, watched over their children, supervised servants, and dealt directly with the clientele. Children grew up and worked in taverns and inns, contributing to the household economy, where they learned skills useful in later life. Bettina's studies demonstrate the importance of consulting a wide range of sources in order to tease out the intricacies of the household and its members. Therefore, in consideration of Bettina's rigorous methodology, I will once again consult notarial documents. Um, it's something I haven't done for several decades to examine the business practices of the women who sold alcohol in taverns and inns across the urban um, landscape. So I just want to conclude with the following. Bettina's use of the household economy is the starting point of, uh, for anyone who intends to study women, work, family, and the economy. It can take you to unexpected places, as it did for me with respect to residential prostitution. Certainly, it will give you a much better grasp of women's complex and diverse roles in the, in, in the household. Both of her books, Working Families and Wife to Widow, are original and influential. Their narratives have had great appeal, not only to students, um, but to historians and others. They represent not only thoroughly researched studies, and these are surely good models uh, for all of us, but also demonstrate Bettina's intellectual de um, development. She has raised the bar for the social, economic, cultural, and political history in Quebec and in Canada. Bettina paints the realities of 19th century women's lives across class, religion, ethnicity, and race 
with compassionate and meticulous brush strokes fleshed out in detailed biographies and rooted in the scholarship of multiple continents. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Our third speaker is Liz Millward. Uh, Liz is an associate professor in the Women's and Gen Gender Studies program at the University of Manitoba, and so we're especially delighted to have her here at the CHA with us. Her book, Women in British Imperial Airspace, 1922 to 1937, published by McGill Queens in 2008, which grew out of her doctoral dissertation supervised by Bettina, was awarded the Canadian Women's Studies Association's annual book prize in 2010. Liz. Thank you. Um, so I'd also like to thank Magda very much for um, inviting me, especially because I am from Women's Studies. Um, and, and so it's a, it's a great honor to be here um, in, in, this, uh, in this session. Um, so I came to Canada in 19, uh, 1995 to pursue an MA in Women's Studies and then subsequently went on to, uh, to do my PhD. And Bettina supervised both my MA thesis and my PhD dissertation. The first one compared discourses about women and aviation in Canada and the USA before 1920. And the PhD dealt with women in imperial airspace from 1922 to 1937, with a particular emphasis on the relationship between England and New Zealand. So although aviation history is quite far from Bettina's own several areas of expertise, <laughs> <laughs> not least because it's necessarily 20th century, um, she was willing to take me on after she'd read a paper I wrote for her for a graduate course in women's studies, um, which she was team teaching. I've never actually asked her why uh, this paper persuaded her, but the paper was on the, the pilot Catherine Stinson. And I think um, Bettina's own scholarship has been so much a part of large shifts in the way history is done and her own shifting focus and the way that she brings things together um, means that she's constantly willing to ask new questions and ask questions in different ways. And so I think she was just up for the challenge. Um, so in the, in the process of writing that paper, which really set me off on a... On a path on which I remain, um, Bettina pushed me to do two things. The first was that she wanted me to find news newspaper accounts about Stinson's um, activities in Canada in 1917 and 1918, so I had to learn to use microfilm. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent hours after classes making my head swim while I was uh, sitting in the library pouring through these microfilms. And uh, in fact, when I was writing this, I'd forgotten that I used to use microfilm because Everything's digitized now. Well, not everything, but... Uh, well, no, no. <laughs> 20th century. <laughs> um, and the second thing she asked me to do was find out what happened to Stinson in the end, um, because the newspapers for the time period obviously didn't say, and then the book about the Stinson family, which were a famous, fam famous flying family in the U.S., um, it, didn't, it, was in the, it was written in the great tradition of aviation history, which means it focuses on the glamorous years of aviation, in part because the mythology of flying is to be young, as uh, Bernard Reiger has demonstrated so well in his work. So uh, Bettina's expectations about the amount of detail that I needed to know in order to make any argument um, completely changed my intellectual life, because what I basically learned through that project and then have continued to learn, I trust, is that in the end, my argument will emerge from the amount of detail, but the detail gives rise to the argument. I don't go in with the argument. Um, up until then, my exposure to history was reading textbooks for the history unit in my American Studies undergraduate degree. Um, and I therefore imagined that in order to write about women pilots, which was not something that any serious scholar was doing, I would read histories of aviation, which were mostly type histories or organizational military histories, and then I would try to add women in. I also thought that I, my job was to note whether they were lesbian, black, or working class, and then I should just stir. Um, <laughs> fortunately, Bettina had a very different set of expectations, <laughs> and these clearly came out of her own work. So one of the first things that I needed to understand was that my job was not just to follow what scholars were saying about aviation as if their interpretations were sufficient. I also had to find out... Um, ideally first, what the avi aviators themselves were saying about the aviation and find out the context in which they were saying it, which meant that in addition to the microfilm, I then had to go into the archives. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, in explaining this to me, Bettina also pointed out two 
notes that, again, I am from women's studies, so I, please I'll accept that. <laughs> um, because they are so obvious, really, that I should not have needed my attention drawn to them. Um, but on the other hand, they, they did completely change my viewpoint. Coming as I do from a British education system, which taught me throughout my education until I got to university, that the English brought civilization to the great races of the world, and we are the greatest race in the world. So I had to unlearn that. So one of the points that she, um, she asked me to recognize immediately is that people in the past were just as compl complex and led just as complicated lives as people in the present. So what she was saying, in effect, is don't be seduced by the myth of progress, or in Foucauldian terms, always interrogate the repressive hypothesis. So the scholars of today do not actually know better than people in the past. They might know more, um, but, but they might also have lost valuable pieces of the picture. In addition, people's motivations and goals will likely be messy, confused, and contradictory. This has been particularly salient in the work I did with three research assistants, undergraduate research assistants from the University of Manitoba, uh, for my more recent work, which is, on, um, which is a cultural geography of lesbian Canada between 1964 and 1984. Um, so I took these three undergraduate research assistants to the Canadian Women's Movement archives and forced them to look at the archives. Um, <laughs> and uh, what is important about the idea that... that um, people's lives are messy and complicated, is that in women's and gender studies and in feminist theory, more as a sort of theoretical realm, more generally, it does seem as if theories get discarded almost every year. That last year's theory about how to explain the oppression of um, groups of women um, is... <laughs> so I couldn't read my notes. Um, is... Um, <laughs> is no longer adequate. It's left something out, so we need to move on and come up with a different theory and, in fact, throw out all of the past theories. So these students had learnt somehow, and they certainly hadn't learnt it from me, that lesbian feminists in the past, because obviously the, the women that I uh, have been currently studying, most of the uh, material is from lesbian feminists in uh, the 1970s predominantly. So these students had somehow learnt, or they'd uh, somehow gathered that lesbian feminists in the past were a grim, repressive, ideologically stringent and strident bunch, and that since sex was based on eroticizing power difference, they were also vehemently anti-sex, um, which any of you who were around in the 1970s will know is not true. Um, but as soon as they got into the archives, they are reading letters and diaries by women who identified as lesbian feminists in the 1970s, and they, of course, encountered a completely different set of stories. So the lesbian feminists that they were reading um, were the same age or even younger than the research assistants themselves. The, uh, the diaries and the letters and the newsletter articles and so forth revealed a, or revealed's not quite the right word, but they, they indicated that here is a group of women who are angry, they're confused, they're hopeful, and they're trying to work out who they are, which is exactly where the research assistants themselves were. Um, and that experience in the archives really challenged what they thought they knew, they, what they thought they knew about themselves, what they thought they knew about lesbians, which, of course, is a category we no longer use anymore, it's so dated, and um, what they thought that they could learn from the past, which up until that point was nothing, right? Don't want to know anything about history because it's, it, it was wrong. Um, <laughs> so um, what happened as a result of that is that, um, you know, we talked about it uh, quite intensively, and they wrote an article about it, which was published in Australian Feminist Studies. So they pulled together their experience and turned it into something that they were then able to share with other uh, other scholars. Um, the other point that Bettina made, um, you know, sort of early on, was that I should not go into an archive with a preformed expectation of what I would find there. Um, of course, I should go in with a sense of what I was looking for, um, and therefore identify the correct archive to go to. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I shouldn't. Um, I shouldn't go in assuming I already knew which sources were relevant. And nor should I go in simply looking for evidence to support my preformed thesis. Instead, I should be going into the archives, and obviously within the constraints um, imposed by funding and time, listen and read, and um, let the voices and the material in that archive start to build up a picture of what was considered important enough to be saved, what was considered important enough to count, 
uh, what perspectives remain, what's missing, and, um, and let that guide me. Um, and also would then lead me to the kinds of questions I would be able to ask and also identify the questions that the, the archives can't answer um, or can't let me ask. So this is the, that was my introduction um, to, to scholarship through Bettina. Um, and then as it's sort of ongoing, after I, after I finished my PhD and, and launched out into my academic career, um, three, there are three sort of influences of Bettina's work that continue to really uh, affect my own scholarship and teaching. So the first is this grounding in uh, using archival material with a real focus on the everyday. Um, so Bettina's work, as all of us know, is, is very focused in the material, in the practical, and has this in extraordinary, marvelous level of detail, which really does bring the past to life. So um, as many of us first encountered this in reading the, the Pigs, Cows, and Borders article, so Bettina, in that article, takes dry census data and transforms it into a rich picture of changes in Montreal over a relatively short period of time. And reading this work, it's as if one's transported. You can almost smell the, f the fresh air or the, the air that's sort of pungent, <laughs> pungent with cow manure and uh, pig manure. And it's starting, that fresh air, that, that space is starting to be shut down through um, narrowing down through the speculative buildings, infill housing, the building on plots of green space. And the light is narrowed down until there's not enough reaching the ground for vegetables to grow. And add to that her attention to the new bylaws, which essentially are promoting modernity through enforcing class differences, the wage economy, and hygiene in uneven ways. And Montreal really does start to spring to life. And in part because of Bettina's own biography, this work is profoundly geographical. So there's a rich level of detail which um, creates Montreal, obviously in terms of a location, but her work also always brings in this geographical sensibility about mobility and place, the meaning of place and the mobility, the extraordinary mobility um, in everyday people's everyday lives. Um, so she's asking questions about who is moving, where are they moving, when are they moving, how are they moving, and why are they moving. So that combination of practical detail with that wider picture has profoundly influenced my own approaches. So in my work on lesbian history, one of my questions has had to be almost immediately is how did lesbians get around? Because, of course, lesbians are, um, we are, uh, typically very, very isolated and therefore have to physically find each other. And at different historical periods, that has been, um, that has been the kind of geographical challenge. So, um, so how did lesbians get around? Did they have access, to, you know, talking about the 1970s, did they have access to cars? Were cars reliable? Were there tr trains? Where did the trains go? Were the roads um, available? Were the roads surfaced or were they dirt roads? Um, how did the women pay uh, to travel across Canada or to get to the States or to get wherever they were trying to go? Uh, where did they sleep? Because obviously road trips are, um, to, can take a long time and so on. So that sort of level of practical detail, some of that information can come from Transport Canada statistics, um, but some of it is also fleshed out through the archival material. So lesbians are talking about in their diaries, in um, articles they write for newsletters to talk about how they found other lesbians. Um, and through letters that they write, they talk about their experience of uh, driving across Canada or taking the train across Canada or even bicycling across Canada and trying to find uh, other lesbians along the way. And so there's that combination of the practical details of what, was the, what were the real constraints coupled with their, sort of, um, their desires and their, their humanity um, is, uh, has influenced my way of thinking. And then a second uh, way in which Bettina's work has organized my thinking is through her emphasis on patriarchy. And again, as I say, in women's studies, we have a tendency to throw out old theories. And so patriarchy, which you'd think would be central to any kind of feminist analysis, um, is barely mentioned anymore in uh, the women's studies context. Um, because now we talk about the gender binary. And one of the problems with the gender binary is it can very easily... Uh, evacuate any discussion of power and power dynamics and, um, and oppression. So uh, patriarchy is a key organizing concept which of course intersects with class, race and empire. And as Bettina points out in Wife to Widow, uh, patriarchy has been widely criticized for being ahistorical and essentialist, for ignoring women's agency and as an inadequate tool for capturing the complex ways in which class, race and gender intersect. And that's very much the, the kind of dismissal um, that, uh, that is often seen in the women's studies classroom. And yet, as she goes on to argue, it's, patriarchy is a 
is equally a cultural, this is a quote, a cultural system that produced and policed gender difference. It was one axis of power that was constantly negotiated and renegotiated in individual relationships and through legal, political, and institutional change. Those negotiations were historically specific and diverse, shaped by class, age, religion, ethnicity, sexuality, and other individual characteristics, as well as by gender. And as she says, this broad way of thinking about patriarchy, um, it, it is a broad way of thinking about patriarchy, and I find it extremely helpful in my own teaching, research, and writing. So, because um, I, I think patriarchy still has value. So, um, in my women's and gender studies classes, I use her arguments about the different forms of companion at patriarchy, which are in conflict in Montreal, to illustrate for first-year undergraduates just how complex patriarchy is and how it is always historically specific. That specificity is built up through the wealth of detail, which never drowns us, but instead shows a network of power relations which everyone had to negotiate. And that really helps to stifle the two um, bugbears of the introduction to women's studies classroom, which are, on the one hand, the version that feminists are all man-haters, and on the other, the version that all men are oppressors. And once you start to look at the sort of rich complexity of patriarchy, you can't make those two simplistic arguments. Um, and then in my own research and writing, whether it's on the Women's Engineering Society in interwar England or lesbian feminists in the 1970s Canada, patriarchy in very different ways keeps appearing as the concept through which the women themselves explain their understanding of how the world is organized and which they wish to change. It's important to attend to what they say. And then finally, I just want to really emphasize Bettina's influence in women's and gender studies you know, beyond the discipline of history. So women's and gender studies, as I'm sort of indicating, does have its own internal uh, dissent and, um, and uh, sort of general ways in which uh, um, women are talked about. And uh, Bettina's ways of, um, of, of researching and approaching the past have really uh, provide a sort of alternative to some of the, the sort of rigid ways in which feminists um, in women's and gender studies can talk about oppression. And so the, the sort of main questions that, um, that I have taken from the way Bettina writes and, and researches and that she influenced me with are, are questions that I think can really orient women's and gender studies moving forward. So these are questions such as, what are the material conditions of people's lives? What are the structures in place? What meanings do people make of their circumstances? What are their circuits of mobility? How do they negotiate all of that? And that any of our feminist theorizing should come out of the answers we get to all of those questions. Thank you, Liz. So the last panelist uh, today is Jared Henderson. And Jarrett completed his PhD at York University in 2010 and is now an assistant professor at Mount Royal University in Calgary. His doctoral thesis entitled Uncivil Subjects, Metropolitan Meddling, Conditional Loyalty, and Lord Durham's 1838 Administration of Lower Canada was awarded the Institut d'Histoire de l'Amérique Française's Louise de Chêne Prize for the best thesis uh, in the history of, of uh, l'Amérique Française, of French America. Uh, and I believe that he's currently revising this thesis for publication as a book. Thank you. Well, I am very excited and very humbled to be here and be able to participate in this roundtable. Um, in honor of Bettina Bradbury, I'd like to thank Magda, the CCWH, and all of you for being here this afternoon. Um, so my contribution seeks to hone in on and draw attention to an aspect of Bettina's scholarship that is often overlooked. Um, so for the next few minutes, I want to use Bettina's approaching, sort of what I'm characterizing as her approaching return to empire as she begins her track to move to New Zealand, <laughs> to, to consider some of the ways that her work, uh, inspired by an international feminist literature on the history of, gendered, uh, history of gender and empire, encourages us and me to think differently about marriage, civilization, and race, as well as the writing of comparative colonial history. To me, Bettina is a historian of empire whose work is rooted in Montreal, and I think this is part of the fact that I arrived at a particular time in Bettina's academic life cycle. Um, and this is sort of what I want to talk a little bit about today. 
To be certain, Bettina is best known for her insightful and groundbreaking study, Working Families, which brought to light the numerous contributions that women and children made to the household economies of industrializing Montreal. Grounded in a close and careful reading of census records and city directories, this work has influenced and continues to influence, as we've all heard today, how students of Canadian, Quebec, and women's history think about how women's unpaid labor not only sustained working class households, but also the lengths, lengths to which many 19th century Montreal women went to ensure the daily survival of their families. Following the publication of Working Families, Bettina began to turn her attention to the question of marriage and widowhood in the industrializing city that she knows so well. That study, the bulk of which was written while I was a graduate student at York, traces how two cohorts of women who married in the 1820s and the 1840s navigated their lives first as wives and then later as widows. It focused, as Bettina explains in the introduction, on the negotiations and renegotiations of patriarchy in women's individual lives and the laws that framed marriage and widowhood and the politics of the period. In part, as she explained in her session at the Berks this past weekend, this project also stemmed from her own dissatisfaction with how historians are u- were using numbers. Rather than simply identifying historical trends, Bettina explained that she sought to analyze what such data could teach us about the lives of individual women in the past. Yet, wife to widow, to me, is much more than this. In fact, I would argue it marks a significant intellectual and historiographical shift in Bettina's own scholarship and a historical transition that the title of the book itself belies. Those women who became wives like Marguerite Perry, Emily Tavernay, and Sarah Harrison, and then later widows, individuals who Bettina continues to call my widows, <laughs> and, and their histories were not only woven into the streets, homes, and benevolent institutions of Montreal, These women also inhabited a larger imperial geography, wherein marriage and its constitutive elements were being remade anew. Marguerite, Emily, and Sarah were women who lived, worked, and even voted, not just in Montreal, but also in a white settler society that was populated by British colonizers, conquered French Canadians, and other migrants, all of whom who had, for generations, dispossessed local indigenous peoples. In thinking about population movement and legal and political debates about marriage in the period, Bettina writes in Wife to Widow, I, Bettina, found (laughs) it useful to conceptualize Montreal as a particular colonial space in which the dynamics of race, class, sexuality, gender, ethnicity, and the workings of difference can be fruitfully approached through the lenses of the rich and growing literature on gender and empire, end quote. Montreal was a colonial city in a very particular sort of British settler society, and one that, as Bettina rightly points out, needs to be reconfigured within the realm of empire. To understand Montreal, and by extension Lower Canada or Quebec, in such a fashion then challenges us as historians to conceptualize the lives of the city's residents and the political, legal, and discursive structures that shaped and helped to give meaning to those lives in ways that demonstrate that history is simultaneously local and global. However, as any of us, as one of Bettina under, however, had any of us um, of Bettina's graduate students written such a wordy sentence as the one that I had just quoted, <laughs> Be- Bettina would have returned a chapter to us with short, clear sentence, scrawled in the margin in her large and loopy text. <laughs> Yet, what this 59 word sentence teaches us. <laughs> is is that the work of feminist historians writing new imperial histories in the last decade of the 20th century and the first decade of the 21st have profoundly influenced the conceptual frame of Wife to Widow. And for those of you at the previous session where Bettina discussed Mary Ann Blanchford's contestation of her husband's will in the Cape Colony, you saw how this work continues to shape her research on marriage, property, and inheritance in the 19th century British Empire. So in the time that I have left, I want to draw your attention to three examples from Bettina's recent and forthcoming work on gender and the politics of empire. This scholarship teaches us much about marriage, civilization, and race, and how to write thoughtful and comparative histories of the 19th century. When I arrived at York in September of 2004, I had just completed an MA on the discourses of gender, race, and empire that late 19th century immigration officials working for the Canadian government had employed to attract colonizers to settle the Canadian Northwest. I fully expected that I would expand that project into a doctoral dissertation. I had no intention of researching or writing about the social, familial, and imperial history of Lord Durham's fraught administration of Lower Canada (laughs) to, to say nothing of its controversial nature. 
What I did know, however, was that I was especially interested in this new and emerging field of gender and imperial history. I had always enjoyed history, but this new feminist history of gender and empire excited me because of the opportunities it offered to reframe historical debates, to alter chronologies, and to move our historical narratives beyond the confines of the nation state. I quickly discovered that Bettina also found this scholarship engaging, and especially so as she was thinking about how to conceptualize the manuscript that became Wife to Widow. As a wide-eyed graduate student, th this timing was perfect. It, it allowed me an opportunity to share ideas, books, and articles with her, and vice versa. As we became better acquainted over my years at York, coffees, lunches, and dinners became opportunities to discuss the work of Antoinette Burton, Philippa Levine, Angela Wolcott, Kirsten McKenzie, Catherine Hall, and others. I could tell you more stories about those later. Um, in, in the summer of 2003, Bettina presented a paper at the British World Conference held in Calgary, where I now live. This was the first time, at least that I think uh, that I'm aware of, that Bettina applied the opportunities offered by comparative colonial history to the question of marriage, though she did publish an article on married women's property rights in New Zealand in 1995. I was not at that British World Conference, but I, along with the other students in Bettina's graduate seminar, read the unpublished version the following year in a course that was not about the history of 19th century Montreal, nor was it about the family, as we might expect. Rather, Bettina's course was on the comparative history of women, gender, and colonialism. It provided me and my colleagues in the class and Bettina with an opportunity to engage with the debates that feminist historians of empire were having over the legacies of imperialism around the globe. For Bettina, this would have particular resonance, resonance, at least I think it did, upon how she came to understand and write about the history of marriage and its relation to ideas about civilization. That paper, titled Colonial Comparisons, was published in Rediscovering the British World in 2005. It drew largely on the arguments made by white, male, and predominantly middle-class colonial politicians to explore the relationship between ideas of civilized colonial space and proper heterosexual marriage practices. In this paper, Bettina pushes us to think about the history of marriage as part of a, quote, broader colonial culture, while the cartography of marriage regimes that she identifies in this paper position white settler societies like Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the Cape with their systems of participatory government as distinct from those imperial spaces under direct rule and inhabited by so-called uncivilized racial, ethnic, and religious groups. Marriage and ideas of civilization, then, worked in tandem to mark difference between colonies, between men and women, and importantly, to preserve white male heterosexual authority throughout the British British settler world. Over the past five years or so, Bettina has remained engaged with this ever-expanding body of feminist scholarship on gender and empire. Her work continues to expose the ways that different colonial spaces provided distinct opportunities to, to the men and women who inhabited them. As such, her interest in comparing and connecting colonies has sparked her to write a paper um, that explores marriage laws in Quebec alongside the Roman Dutch law of the Cape Colony. This paper, and I just love the title, so I want to read it. Um, in England, a man can do as he likes with his property. Migration, Family Fortunes, and Law in 19th Century Quebec and the Cape. This will be published in a forthcoming collection called Transnationalizing Canada. This paper, like colonial comparisons, was written and researched as Bettina was completing Wife to Widow. This comparative essay explores how two couples, Anne-Marie Blanchford and her husband in the Cape Colony and Mr. and Mrs. Kerr of Quebec, were able to profit not only from the dispossession of indigenous peoples and the possibilities that empire offered, but also from the spaces of difference created by Roman Dutch law in the Cape and the custom of parents, Paris in Lower Canada or Quebec. Debates about marriage or inheritance law were both local issues and transnational questions, concludes Bettina in this paper. They were never only about the intimate and economic rights of men and women within families. The final aspect of her work on empire that I want to acknowledge, notwithstanding her gigantic project on marriage, inheritance, and property that looks at Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the Cape, is a paper that Bettina and I co-author that explores how British colonizers in the metropole understood race, the differences between colonists of French and British origins, and political rights in the colony of Lower Canada and the wider British Empire in the 1830s. This paper, which stems in part from my own doctoral research and is inspired um, by Bettina's own engagement with feminist histories of empire, will be published sometime in the next year. When we first set out to write this paper by spreading and then stacking countless documents into various piles on Bettina's dining room table, and then we discovered that we needed to do this on the floor, we, we had done so because we wanted to address the relative absence within Quebec historiography of works that place colony and metropole in one frame. 
We also want to consider how French Canadians were marked as different by imperial administrators and racialized in the broader debates and practices of empire. We thought it would be helpful to grapple with the cultural and political significance of this tumultuous decade, not just within the colony, but also in terms of Lower Canada's place within, within the empire. Important debates over these years place questions of race, difference, and politics at the heart of public public and political discussions in the metropole, as it did in the colonies, and this in turn shifted cultural understandings of what it meant to be free or unfree, white and black as slavery was dismantled, Catholic rights established, and indigenous people's possibilities of survival and civilization examined. One of the debates that we examined in this paper, or in that paper, is a debate in the British Parliament over the 1828 Select Committee on Civil Government for the Canadas. We found that the Whig opposition contested some of the ways that the Tory government represented the colony, its peoples, and its laws, while still sharing others. One such Whig, Sir James McIntosh, omitted any mention of slavery's existence historically in Canada or of its indigenous inhabitants when he addressed the matter of governance in Canada, a government's governance in Parliament. Mackintosh, who had been a recorder in Bombay for seven years, echoed the colonial secretary's assertion of the absence of the, quote, slavery of the West and the case castes of the East. But he also added to the cartography of colonial difference. He stressed that Canada was also exempt from, quote, the embarrassments of that other great continent which we have chosen as a penal settlement. In, in this mapping of colonies, then, Whigs and Tories agreed that Canada was untainted, untainted by being a colonial colony of slavery, a penal colony, or by distinctions of caste. These three threads constituted reminders that the colonists of the Canadas were understood as not black, not divided by caste as in India, nor peopled predominantly by unfree and mostly working class convicts as in New South Wales or Tasmania. Aboriginal inhabitants disappeared from the debate, and the whiteness of both groups of European colonizers was taken for granted. It became the norm against which the inadequacies of other races were defined. In short, we came to the conclusion that directly and indirectly, these debates shaped the ways Lower Canada and its peoples were incorporated in the rapidly changing colonial order of things, in this particular, and if to say nothing of perhaps peculiar, white settler society. So, to conclude... Bettina has often described herself, when she is asked to do so, as a New Zealander who studies Quebec. But how she has done this is also of particular importance, and part of that story is her turn to empire. Bettina's imperial turn is important because it demonstrates how her intellectual interests have simultaneously evolved, all the while remaining rooted in the feminist histories and politics that first inspired her historical research some 30 years ago. Furthermore, Bettina's scholarship on the history of British imperialism matters in and of itself because the arguments that she has made and will continue to make, though no longer from her home on Rush Home Road, but from Wellington in New, Wellington, New Zealand, will surely continue to influence and inspire graduate students and historians alike for many more years to come. Thank you. been listening to a recording of A Scholarly Tribute to Bettina Bradbury, Feminist Historian of the Family, a roundtable discussion. The roundtable was chaired by Magda Farney and featured panelists Dominique Marshall, Mary Ann Putinen, Liz Millward, and Jared Henderson. The session was held Monday, May 26, 2014, as part of the Canadian Historical Association annual meeting. You can find recordings of other talks at activehistory.ca.